Hi, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. Today's topic is going to be nutrition and adulthood. To begin with, we know that as we age as adults, we may need to reduce our caloric intake to match our energy expenditure. So um, as we age, our metabolism slows, and in order to keep our BMI balanced um, at that healthy weight of 18 and a half to 24.9 BMI, we very well may need to cut back on the amount of calorie consumption to be sure that it matches the amount of energy expenditure through exercise. Um, as we talk about adults, or especially older adults, dehydration is going to be the most common fluid and electrolyte imbalance. We all know that we should be eating a balanced diet. Think back to everything you've learned about the five food groups from my plate, and we know that we should be eating grains, mostly whole grains. Our vegetables should be of a wide variety of all colors. Fruits, same thing, a wide variety of all colors. They can be fresh, dried, canned, um, or juices, although we, want, we do want to avoid products that have additional sugar added. We know that fruit itself is a simple sugar, so you're always going to have some sugar in fruit naturally, but we do want to avoid added sugars. Dairy, roughly three cups per day. Protein can be vegetarian protein. It can be a variety of sources of non-vegetarian protein. Um, oils, vegetable oils, um, try to avoid palm and coconut oils. Vitamins are recommended if the diet is imbalanced. Um, some adults do have a difficult time uh, eating a completely balanced diet. Now, it is much preferred that um, all of our nutrients, including vitamins and minerals, come from natural whole foods that are minimally processed. But if for whatever reason the diet is not balanced, supplements are recommended. And then we know that we want that two to three liters of fluid per day. Um, that fluid could be water, natural juices. What we want to avoid is soda and caffeine. Anything that has sugar or salt in it is actually going to cause the body to dehydrate quicker. All adults should be exercising at least 150 minutes per week. This, could in, this is moderate exercise, which would include gardening, yard work, golf, dancing, brisk walking, to name a few. When we talk about moderate exercise, this is exercise in which uh, the adult is slightly out of breath, but able to carry on a conversation throughout the exercise. Regular exercise we know improves bone density in older adults, relieves depression, enhances our cardiovascular and respiratory function. Now, of course, there are some nutritional concerns as we age. Um, oral problems and a decrease in salivation make it difficult to chew, to swallow, and sometimes we do need um, dentures as we age. Um, if those dentures do not fit properly, Again, that is contributing to nut nutritional problems. Um, aging causes the body to not absorb minerals and vitamins as well, to not use insulin as well, even though our pancreas is still producing it. Oftentimes our body is not using it as efficiently. As we age, we often lose lean muscle mass and um, a decreased calcium in our body, especially if we're not intaking enough calcium, will reduce bone density. Moving on to a broader discussion about BMI and obesity. Very important that you know how to calculate BMI, but also that you, and probably more importantly, that you know the ranges for underweight, normal, overweight, obese, and extremely obese. So underweight is gonna be a BMI less than 18 and a half. And remember, um, BMI is based on the client's weight in kilograms and their height in meters squared. So these are universal numbers for adults, whether male or female. So underweight less than 18 and a half. Normal weight is 18 and a half to 24.9. Overweight, 25 to 29.9 obese 30 to 34.9 and extremely obese is going to be greater than 35. Now at the top of the screen I have provided you with the obesity classes. So a class one is going to be a BMI of 30 to 34.9, 
corresponding with that obese category. Um, 30, obesity class two is 35 to 39.9, and then a class three obesity is a BMI greater than 40, um, predisposing the client to significant health risks. Obesity itself is a result of excessive calorie intake compared to energy expenditure. So we're eating more calories than we are working off through exercise. Um, we've already talked about BMI. Let's talk about waist circumference. So in females, the waist circumference greater than 35 inches um, indicates uh, obesity. And in males, a waist circumference greater than 40 inches is indicative of obesity. There are lots of lab tests that we can use to determine health risks from obesity. Um, we can screen for type 2 diabetes, which we know is closely linked to obesity. Fatty liver disease and thyroid disorders all closely linked to obesity. So we can monitor total cholesterol, triglycerides. Um, as part of that lipid panel, we also want to look at LDL and HDL. Um, fasting blood glucose, our hemoglobin A1C, and then for that fatty liver disease, we do want to look at our liver function studies, such as the AST and the ALT. Obesity itself uh, does reduce life expectancy, um, puts the client at risk for a lot of chronic disorders, causes uh, perioperative complications, and um, pregnancy complications, just to name a few. Now, as the body ages, there are a lot of effects on nutrition. We've named a few, but let's dig a little bit deeper. Inadequate calcium and vitamin D intake and lack of weight-bearing exercise will lead to osteoporosis. Um, arthritis often causes difficulty with food preparation. Dementia will cause problems with being able to shop, to prepare foods, to manage a household, all leading to malnutrition. Medications, they can interact with foods, or foods can interact with our medications, either enhancing the effects of that medication or diminishing the effects of that medication. Um, medications can also cause electrolyte imbalance. Um, as we age, we do tend to um, lose smell and vision, and both of those can interfere with our interest in food. So when things don't smell good or we don't see very well, it does become difficult to find some foods appealing. Um, as we age, sometimes difficulty with chewing or swallowing contributes to malnutrition. Social isolation um, which often causes depression, which does contribute to malnutrition, and then being on a fixed income. Um, you know, it, it's very easy to tell um, adult clients they need to eat fresh fruits and vegetables and high quality proteins, but those foods are more expensive than lower quality nutritional foods. Um, so being on that fixed income does often contribute to malnutrition. There are numerous community supports that are available for adults to access, so let's talk about a few of them. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP, that is a, um, an income-based program. So that used to be our, our food stamps program in the United States, <clears throat> but now it's just called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and um, you qualify based on your financial status. There are also some non-financial factors, but by and large, it's based um, on financial factors. There's also the Emergency Food Assistance Program. This eligibility is based also on household income. There are some adult uh, and child care food programs throughout our country. These provide meals and snacks for children up to age 12 and to senior citizens who are participating in daycare programs that are government funded. Um, we have the Senior Nutrition Program. This includes the Congregate Meals Program and Home Delivered Meals Programs. These are um, often inexpensive meals, but also education and socialization for adults who are 60 years and older based on financial and social needs. And then many communities have the availability of food banks for their citizens. 
Okay, let's dive into some specific age groups. So the early years, this is gonna be our 20s and 30s. Lifestyle continues to be time restricted and positive health behaviors tend to fall by the wayside. So it is in those 20s and 30s that we really start to abandon um, a lot of our healthy lifestyle habits that maybe we've maintained up until that point. And unfortunately, that abandonment is what is gonna set us up for chronic health problems later in life. Um, young adults in this age are going to separate from their families. Sometimes as they separate, they lose that, that home cooked meal or that, you know, parental oversight of nutrition, which contributes to problems. Um, we become much more focused on our family and career goals, sometimes forgetting to eat healthy, not having time to exercise. And then women in this age do face reproductive decisions. Um, but now is really the time to hopefully maintain um, good healthy habits, but if not, is really the time to establish them. Again, all in the effort to prevent chronic health problems in the future. Um, women of childbearing age, um, dieting, significant dieting does contribute to loss of calcium and to iron deficiency. And starvation dieting will actually slow the metabolic rate and work really in the opposite way that we intend. So therefore we're not losing weight because the metabolic rate has been so significantly slowed. Maintaining calcium and iron intake is a, is a major concern for women in the early years. Uh, moving into the middle years, 40s and 50s, again, we see this continuation of family and career demands. It limits our time, our time to cook, our time to exercise. So prioritizing nutrition and exercise is really important. Maintaining those positive dietary patterns as well as regular exercise, so, so, so important in the middle years. Um, this does prevent diet-related diseases and helps to maintain stamina as we age. Vitamin and minerals, um, mineral needs do not significantly change from the 20s and 30s to the 40s and 50s. So our requirements are roughly the same as far as vitamins and minerals. However, after menopause, women will not need as much iron. They're not losing um, you know, iron through the bleeding of menstruation. So the requirements will drop after menopause. Dietary patterns still need to contain nutrient dense foods that are whole, foods, meaning minimally processed. Um, we want that low fat diet, um, good protein, healthy protein foods coupled with fiber. Those are gonna give us our best chance at preventing chronic um, diet related problems. Moving on to the older years, 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, for many um, adults this age, we do see continued professional and career development, while some will move into retirement and recreational enjoyment. Um, quality of life is dependent on our health status and our disease management. So how well did we do preventing diet-related disease in those early and middle years? Um, our nutritional well-being, our living arrangements, our social interactions, our mental, physical, and emotional well-being, and then the level of independence. Um, all of those um, are highly dependent, or our quality of life is highly dependent on all of those bulleted um, items. Moving into the oldest years, 80s and 90s, nutrient needs still remain pretty stable. However, the effects of aging will continue to reduce the ability of the body to absorb and synthesize nutrients. So we might see more supplementation needed. Patterns of dietary intake are necessary that meet both physical and social needs. We've talked already about the importance of so or the um, the detriment of social isolation. Um, so we really want to be meeting both physical and social needs um, to manage the effects of malnutrition. Okay, so that was just a quick recap of nutrition in adulthood. Um, if you have any questions, certainly do not hesitate to reach out, and I hope this presentation was helpful. Have a wonderful day.